Payday loans are a big problem, even for seniors. Why do seniors get into trouble with payday loans? If you are a senior or the child of one, you'll want to listen to today's episode. Ted is here, and you know how much he loves payday loans. Let's begin. This is Debt Free in 30. Here's your host, Doug Hoyes. By the time you approach retirement age, conventional wisdom says you should be debt free and have some savings. Do you agree with that? Does that, that make That's what they told us in the 40s, the there 50s, you go. and the 60s. Doesn't happen a lot anymore, but uh, our 2023 Joe Debtor study found that 12% of all consumer insolvencies in Canada were filed by senior citizens, which we define as age 60 or older. Sure. So that means we're senior citizens. I think most of the systems now do it at 55. So we're really. So we're, we're both senior (laughs) citizens. There you go. Actually, I don't turn 60 for another two weeks or whatever it is. Right. Um, Up from 11% in 2022. On average, insolvent seniors carry a total unsecured debt of about Mm 58,000. Now that's down from the 61,000 in 2022, but it is the nature of debt. And we've talked about this before. Yep. It ain't pretty. 91% filed with credit card debt, up from 87% the year before. For insolvent seniors with credit card debt, average balances increased by 4% to Mm -hmm. $23,000. 28% of seniors filing for insolvency owed money to a payday lender. That's the scary one. We're going to talk about that today. But the average. Yeah, an average payday loan debt of $10,000, which is three and a half times their monthly income. We're going to talk about that. Another 7% carried extremely high interest installment loans, loans. Which they get from the payday lenders to help them pay off their payday loans yes. before they get new payday loans. So <laughs> we know why payday loans are a problem. Why are they specifically a problem if you are a senior? Well, the biggest issue with the seniors, obviously, is they're on fixed incomes. Uh, hopefully some sort of pension or the RIF or I mean, however they've got the money coming in, they're probably not working anymore. So you can predict with great accuracy how much revenue they're going to receive. And the payday loans just mess that whole thing up. And that's the problem. So here's some more stats. We saw an increase in two income households among senior debtors. So 20% of seniors up from 18% in 2022. What does that mean? I don't know. It's just kind of an interesting stat. Um, Similarly, we saw an increase in married senior debtors, which I guess is there's obviously an overlap there, 35% versus 32% the previous year and an increase in male senior debtors. Hmm. Hmm. Only 3% were homeowners. Does that surprise you in the least? No, because if you're going to have trouble in your golden years, it's because you don't have any gold. There you go. (laughs) Hey, I like that. Maybe that'll be the title of the podcast. They have the highest credit card usage of all age groups, 37% of their unsecured debt. So why are seniors turning to payday loans, you know, other than the obvious, which is they can't keep up? Like, but seniors among all the different age brackets that we use are the ones that were taught to, you got to pay your bills. You got to find a way to pay your bills. They worked their whole life. They retired. They're carrying debt. They never should have carried. They max that out because they want to meet those obligations. So I'll take it out of this card and put it on the next one. And eventually they run out of card space. And so all that leaves them is payday loans. So your theory is that seniors are conscientious. Right. That's a that's the word to use for it. There yes. you go. Well, that's what you're saying. That, I am. I'm saying you know, they feel responsible. They, they feel responsible. borrow the money, so they've got to find a way to pay it. And to them, that means borrowing it from somebody else. Now, and I agree with that. And you've met with lots of people in exactly that situation. So right. you're not just coming up, coming up, you know, off the top of your head. So let's break this down a bit. So I'm a senior and I have debt partly because my income is fixed, but my expenses are going up. What else characterizes a senior? How else does a senior get into debt? Uh, They could be helping family members because you never stop being a parent, right? Which kind of goes into your conscientious theory. Right. And you don't want to admit to the family that you're in trouble. So Uh a grandkid comes and says, you know, I need some money for whatever. Um, Grandma finds a way to get the money. And... Not even the grandkids, but my kids. Yes. Because if I'm 70 years old, I guess I've got a kid who's, I don't know, 40. Right. And they've gone through a divorce. They've lost their job. They're trying to buy a house. They're trying to refund, whatever. And I've always been the parent. Right. Because you're always a parent. Mm -hmm. And so I want to help them out. So that's what kind of causes the problem. Um, Why then are payday loans so eager to help them? Because the word payday loan suggests you've got a job. Right. But they don't. They don't. Well, so I think the payday lenders are willing to lend to seniors because they've got that um, 
like a moral ethic that they feel they have to repay. But if you think about it, a senior could simply stop paying them, and there's not a hell of a lot they could do under hmm. the law. And so the payday lender is lending against a future stream of income, not just a paycheck. Right. And so if you've got a, a pension, well, I know how much it's going to be. So kind and of like I, what you said. And I know when it's going to arrive. And so I can set you know, the payments right up. What none of them are taking into account is our statistic that says the average senior that's got payday loans owes their $9,600 worth of them. And their pension is 3000 bucks. Yeah, because they have more than one. Right. That never should have been able to happen. And you know, that's... They're bad enough by themselves, but when they start traveling in packs, you really are screwed. You got a problem. Now, we already addressed this. There's payday loans and then what we call rapid loans, which yeah. are kind of include payday loans, but also include the larger installment loans. Right. And 35% of insolvent seniors age 60 or older carry a rapid loan. 28% borrow from a traditional payday lender, so 28 out of that 35, and 7% take on subprime high interest installment loans. <laughs> so this is like the worst of all worlds. Right. Borrowing against a stable pension, seniors with this type of debt owe an average of 13000 in combined rapid loans that carry an interest rate anywhere from 39 to 59% for high interest installment loans to an effective rate of 390% for payday loans. Now, I believe we did a podcast a while ago about the new laws. Right which I don't believe have actually come into effect yet. Yeah, they'll impact that 59%. percent drop it down to 47 Yeah, on a and there's the difference between APR and actual and all the rest of it. It's right. supposed to come down. Now, it's somewhat curious that it hasn't happened yet. Or is it? I don't uh, know. It's not a priority for anyone. That's that's why. So so it's it's a big problem. Like these are right. these are, are serious numbers. And but it's not every senior out there. It's a specific segment of it. And right. as we already said, only 3% of them are homeowners, meaning the vast majority yeah. aren't. So you've got Canadians in general fall into one of three categories. The financially well-to-do, that's the top third. The middle third that's getting by and the bottom third that's in trouble. And unfortunately, more and more seniors are now falling into that bottom third because their income is fixed going forward. They finish their working career, whatever assets they may have had, those are all the assets they're ever going to get unless their own parents pass something on to them. And it's just the situation gets worse because pensions are not, um, what's the word I'm looking for, indexed the, to the same sort of level that inflation. The last couple of years just killed them. Yeah, we had high inflation, but it, pensions didn't go up. And nobody has a company pension anymore. Right, they're unless gone. You, unless you work and, for the government. And nobody has the defined benefit pensions anymore. They're all contributions, which is you get out of this what you get out of it. Yep. And clearly that has not been sufficient. Now, if you owned a house, bought a house 20 years ago, okay, well, you're probably not on this list. Right. Because your house has gone up with inflation. You've been able to, uh, right. to, to borrow against it. Now, this whole thing about supporting adult children. Wow. Yep. And this is something you have seen more than once, I'm guessing. Mm -hmm. It's not a not an uncommon thing. There was a, a survey done by, I don't know, some mutual fund company or something that said <laughs> six in 10 retirees help their adult children with either living expenses or big ticket purchases like a home. Does right. that surprise you? It doesn't. And it, it's the issue is of those six, how many actually had the money versus how many of them borrowed the money so they could lend it to their kids? Because if you've got a million bucks in the bank and you've got a good pension and you own a house and you've got a bunch of investments and your kid needs 50 bucks, right. no problem. Here's Unless you're bucks. my wife, you can't spend it fast <laughs> enough. <laughs> so we should get her on the podcast. <laughs> um, but if you have no money or have no assets and have to borrow, right? then obviously that... It, well, I, that's to me, it's an obvious problem. Right. Well, I mean, think about it. So if your adult child can't borrow the money themselves and you have to borrow it for them, all you're doing is transferring the risk from the bank to yourself. So you're saying, I'm going to find a way to pay this back so that you can help your kid. Now, again, you never stop being a parent, so you're going to try and find ways to help your kid. I'm not sure that's the best way to do it. I got a worse way. Okay. Co-signing. Oh, that is a worse way. Yep. So... I, I don't have the money, but if I co-sign for my kid, then everything's great, right? Sure, until your kid stops paying and they come looking for it from you. And as we've said many times on this show, co-signing means you're fully liable for it. That's right. It's not that you're liable if they, it, well, basically, if the bank doesn't get paid, they're going to take the money from you. That's the short answer. And so if your kid who's, you know, 40 years old or 30 years old or whatever. Could be a woman. 
Could be a kid. I, I said kid. <laughs> that's that's gender neutral, I think. Um, if your kid, as you say, doesn't qualify for a loan on their own, their income presumably isn't sufficient or they've had challenges in the past, what are the chances they'll be able to pay you back? Right. Like you're taking on a, a pretty big risk there. Well, and, and it's uh, you're at the point in your life when you should be taking on risks. I mean, the whole point of calling them the golden years is you're supposed to be able to relax, do some of the things that you've never had time to do in the past. It's an easier pace to your life. Well, if you start incurring all kinds of debt, it isn't easier. The stress levels are stress levels go equal to your debt levels. The more debt you have, the more stress you have. So are you seeing more seniors who are continuing to work? They're working on the side. Um, I mean, the, the issue we see first is they seniors carrying debt into retirement. 20 years ago, that just didn't happen. So now we've got folks that are going on to a fixed income with a level of debt that, that nobody's ever seen before. So the only way they can make, make ends meet is to go out and get some sort of part-time job or maybe even a full-time job or join the gig economy, which they don't understand. <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess if I'm a senior, I can drive for Uber. Sure, but driving for Uber is no way to make any money. No, you don't make any money. And, you know, I can get a, I can work in retail. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously there were seniors who worked in high level positions who presumably be, can, can become consultants or whatever. Yep. So there's nothing wrong from for a senior working. In fact, I encourage it if it gets you out of the house and keeps you busy. It becomes stressful when you have to work because you're carrying too much debt. Yeah, and if you can't, again, you're, and as you get older, as you and I both know, you know, you start to slow down a bit. You get health issues. It's you can't quite put in I, the same sixty hours a, a week that you that you used to. So, okay, well, let's. Uh, that's been all pretty depressing. So, <laughs> let's talk about practical advice then here. And I want to look at this from the point of view of the senior, but also from the point of view of an adult child who realizes that their parent has some debt issues. Well, and that's actually you hit on a, another problem. Parents aren't going to tell their children they have debt issues. They're not going to tell them that they're carrying all this debt. If, as far as the parent's concerned, if we tell the kids everything is good. We can't tell them that. That's just not appropriate. So as a kid who has an elderly parent, because by definition, your parents are older than you, right? One would hope. So even when you were 20, your parents were I guess if elderly, you were born on February 29th, maybe. Then yeah. that's possibly they wouldn't be. <laughs> How could you tell if your parents are in dire financial shape and aren't, sharing it with you what are there any warning signs that would pop well, up so i mean this is difficult with seniors anybody but you watch for behavioral differences so they don't want to go with the family out for some kind of social event and they, you know they'll tell you i just don't feel well or i'm tired and the reality is they haven't got the cash to do it or they make sure that you're never around when they're taking the mail out of the mailbox because there's a whole stack of bills they don't want you to see or you know they the uh grandkids or nieces or nephews or whomever uh, ask for some kind of help and you know they just they don't have it when they pull out their their cash if anybody still carries cash instead of being a, a stack of 20s they got a stack of fives and then it just leaves them with nothing yeah the behavioral changes is an interesting one because mostly they crawl into themselves right? yeah <clears throat> well when you were a kid it was you know your parents who took you out for dinner that's right. how it worked and and when they're older while well, they still want to do that but okay taking someone out for dinner now you almost need a loan to do that right and so it's like yeah you know uh you're right i'm not feeling well i got this issue i got that issue right. um and like, other than that, I don't know how else, other than hacking their bank account, you can see. Um, the issue about the, the bills is an interesting one, because you're right, probably everything's online now, and it's easier to hide right. it. Yeah, I mean, the time that most adult children find out that their parents are in financial distress is when some sort of health incident occurs. And so suddenly now, I've got to be looking at my parents' mail or their emails, and I'm trying to get on top of things, and then I realize, oh my God, they've got seven credit cards and they owe fifty thousand dollars. Yeah, and the time to have that conversation with anybody is as soon as possible. Um, I don't know how you broach it with your parents though, because they're your parents. They've right. always been the in the you know position of authority or whatever. Um, but I guess the answer is, well, the same way you broach it with anyone, it's you, right. you chat and how's it going and what's yeah. happening. And, and you have to have the same conversation with your kids. Yep. Cause it, I mean, one of the reasons that our generation is getting, um, stuck is because we've got it coming from both ends. Maybe the parents are in trouble. Maybe the kids are in trouble and you're the one trying to help everybody. 
So yeah, the, the, that's a different show. Well, but the prime age for someone to file an insolvency is around 45. Right. Because you're supporting your kids and maybe you're supporting your parents. Maybe. So understanding how all those things work is, is obviously pretty important. So, okay. So practical advice. Now you already hit on point number one, which is don't enter retirement with debt. Right. Now that's easy for us to say. Sure. Just don't do it. You know, but in fact, enter retirement with a billion dollars. That would be better. <laughs> but it's an old Steve Martin routine. I'm sure it is. How to become a millionaire. First, get a million dollars. Well, thank right. you, Steve. That was helpful. Thank, thanks anyway. for coming out. So, okay. I'm, I'm, you know, 40 years old, 50 years old. I got debt. I want to retire someday. I want to retire with no debt. There's no magic formula for that, is there? there? Are, but you have to have a plan. And the plan normally involves spending less than you actually earn. So if you're starting out with debt, that means you've got to spend less than you earn sufficient enough to pay down the debt. But what you want to get to the point is where you don't have any debt and you still spend less than you earn so you can set something aside. Yeah, and it's a difficult balance because the time to do stuff is when you can do stuff. Right. Like when I'm 90 years old, I'm probably not going hang gliding or whatever. Seems unlikely. I'm not doing it now and right. never will. So I, I can pretty much guarantee that. So obviously you want to have fun. Like if you're 45 years old and your kids are 15 or 10 or whatever, now's the time to be taken on a, on a family vacation. Right. Not when they're 30. So you kind of got to spend some money when you're young. But the flip side is if you spend too much when you're young, then you're, you're in debt when you retire. So right. I guess it's... Like anything else, you got to figure out, here's what I got to shave. And mm -hmm. like, there, there's no magic wow. to it though, is there? The barber was right. Yeah, exactly. Um, he's doing new videos now. If you're watching, we're, <laughs> we're watching them. Um, the What do you think about downsizing earlier? Yeah, I'm, quite frankly, if the, I think it's intelligent. I have this conversation with my wife. As you know, we got a house and we got the three girls. And the plan is as soon as they're done high school, they'll get into a much smaller house. Man, I don't have to clean a damn thing. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm a big fan of downsizing or right sizing is a better way to describe it. Yeah, right it. sizing is a is a better word. And I understand if you got three kids, okay, you need a, a facility that can house three kids. Mm -hmm. But as soon as you can get those three kids moved on. That's right. Then, uh, sorry, kids, we've moved to a one bedroom apartment. Some place uh, with no grass to cut. That's or, right. You can't, you can't come back for a visit. So, and so the, the conventional wisdom is, okay, or not, maybe not wisdom, but the way it works is my kids move out. I keep the family home for a while because I know they're going to come back. And but whatnot. the conventional wisdom is based on the assumption that there's no mortgage anymore. Mm -hmm. So the fact is that the carrying costs for living in your home are your utilities and your taxes. If you're still carrying debt, utilities, taxes, and now mortgage payments on a fixed income, that's hard to do. Yeah. And when house prices always went up forever, forever, like from 2010 to 2022 or whenever it was, then I guess having too big a house wasn't such a big deal because mm -hmm. the, the equity was increasing. But if we get into a softer real estate market or a correction or a correction and we're, uh, <laughs> the you know, signs I mean, are there. we're in the summer of 2024 now, as we record this and it's a little softer. Now, of course, interest rates have come down one little tick. Yeah. Well, so you get, you're renewing a mortgage now at 5%. And I mean, depending on term and when it, whatever, right. yep. but obviously if you got that mortgage at 2%, then that's a, that's Pretty a huge big number. Right. So I guess what you're saying as well, you don't have to wait five years after the kids have all left. It might be better to, to do that right sizing sooner. Right. Or at least discuss it and look at your options. Because if there is equity in your house and you can take that out, okay, well maybe I can generate enough interest to be paying the rent. Who the hell knows? Yeah, which is, I guess, the the next point on our list here. You mm. want to avoid living on credit card debt during retirement. So Correct. you want to get your debt as low as possible, ideally zero, before yep. you retire. And part of that is right-sizing your expenses. But right-sizing your expenses now means that they will be right-sized when you retire. Correct. So other than the house, okay, maybe we need one car, not two. Yeah. Maybe we need to live closer to the city so we can, you know, transit uh, you, is easier. Yeah. You know that there are people every, every two years, they get themselves a new car. Maybe you don't need to do that anymore. They're taking vacations every year. Maybe you don't need that anymore. It's all a question of uh, have a realistic expectation of what you're going to do in your retirement and, and make sure that it live, you live within your means. Yep. 
Well, and, and our strategy is clearly we haven't bought any new clothes in, in <laughs> at least 10 years. So Check that, every video. I always that's wear, right. Yeah. I'm wearing a white shirt. It's uh, You can tell it's warmer because we don't have our jackets on. Um, okay, so pre-planning your living costs and adjusting them to your future income, which you're right. It doesn't mean you have to do something today. Right. But if I know that when I retire, my income is going to be X number of dollars a month, Okay, well, then I guess I should start living on that or less now because that's what I'm going to have to do. Learn how to do it. One of the common mistakes is people retire, they switch to this fixed income, but they don't adjust their living expenses. So they carry on as if they're still making that salary or income, whatever they had from their job, and they aren't. Yeah, and some of your expenses will go down because, okay, I'm not driving to the office five days a week. I don't have to buy a suit every six months or whatever. But now I've got all this time on my hands. Right. Right. And so, you know, don't spend it on the shopping channel. There you go. Well, or I guess I can go golfing five days a week or I can, mm. I don't know what. And if you have a do, golf but. membership, it doesn't cost you any extra. So maybe, you know, but it's a matter, again, yeah. plan out what's going to make sense and live within your means. Yeah. And if the idea is I'm going to be traveling the world, okay, there's probably a, a need cost, more money. cost to that. So, okay, let's assume, though, that the picture is not as rosy as we're painting it. Okay. Which is why we get to the next piece of practical advice on our list. Be aware of predatory lending practices like payday loans and potential financial scams, including a lot of scams that target vulnerable seniors. Mm -hmm. You got any comments on any of that? Sure. So if uh, somebody contacts you and the number comes up that it's, you know, it says government of Canada as opposed to GDC, whatever the hell. English and French. That's right. Uh, Probably it's not real. Or if they call you, you get an email that says, um, your package hasn't been delivered. You need to contact us to arrange for the shipping or tax. It's probably not real. I mean, it's it's so easy to trick individuals into thinking something is real. It's the whole fake news thing, mm-hmm. only it's with debts. Well, if I'm 70 years old, when I was growing up, the government was actually something I could trust. If someone mm-hmm. called and said they were from CRA, then right. I, I guess they were called Revenue Canada back then, but... You know, I, I, uh, I assumed it was legit. And, and when I look on my phone and it says CRA, I assume it must be CRA. Right. And I don't kind of think through the, the, uh, the implications of it. So um, I don't know. Well, I, I think some scams are easier to pull on seniors. Sure. Because they may be less tech savvy. Mm-hmm. Other scams they wouldn't fall for. Like if someone knocks on their door, well, they may be less likely because they've been shooing away door to door salesmen for their whole life. So, right. but just be aware. So, those are scams and the predatory lending. Well, we've already talked about that. Right. Um, my advice to a senior would be the same as my advice to everyone else do the math. Right. What's this actually going to cost you and, uh, and make a decision based on that? Um, number three, we've already mentioned this as well. Avoid loaning money you cannot afford to lose or co-signing loans for friends or family. So you're a senior. Your kid comes to you and says, hey, I need to borrow some money. And you don't have the money. Right. What's the answer? Help them find it someplace else. If they, if, if they need you to help them apply for credit someplace so so to obtain debt then there's an underlying issue that needs to be addressed first so what if your kid comes to you and says hey dad i've got a a new job in the next city over Mm -hmm. so the good news is i'll be moving out of the house so you and mom can right size so this is fantastic but i need you know first and last month's rent for my deposit i've just graduated from school i don't have that money i've got a decent job i'll be able to pay you back under those circumstances, would you loan them the money? Yeah. So if you have the money and savings are available, then I'm not against lending children or other family members money. If you have to borrow to loan somebody else money, then you're making a mistake. Because they might not be able to. But if you right. don't if you don't loan them that money, they can't rent that apartment and can't get that job in the next city over. Hmm. Then I guess it wasn't meant to be. <laughs> there you go. Well, they're, they're living with you, I guess, is the, is the <laughs> That's thing. That's right. So, yeah, and I guess my answer to that question would be, okay, it's your kid. Here, I will give you the money. Right. Because you're probably not going to be able to pay me back anyways, or at least not in the in the near future. Um, but hopefully, you know, as gr- you've been growing up, I've been instilling in you some, you know, 
some financial literacy. Again, easy for us to say on this podcast. Sure. So you go to school, your parents didn't have any money, you graduate with a bunch of student loans. Mm -hmm. well, what are you supposed to do? Right. And so I don't I don't blame kids. I think it's you, we both have to see where where it's going on both sides of this. There's probably a documentary that covers some of be. this stuff. <laughs> if I was doing one, it would be called Deticized. Now available <laughs> on the Debt Free and 30 channel. Okay, so let's say that I'm a senior, I worked at a company and, it, you know, like you said, they had a an RSP plan. And right. so I've put money into that. I've got some money there. Um, my kid needs help. Should I cash in some or all of my RSP to help them? Um, depending on how close you are to retirement and how much you've got in the RSP, my answer is going to be different. Because there, there's actually a threshold that if your RSP is below a certain amount, you're better off to cash the whole damn thing in because then you might qualify for OAS and GIS, the extra, sub, the extra pensions from the government. But as a general rule, you shouldn't be cashing out your retirement to help family members now. What if you have debt of your own and you want to cash in your RSP to clean it off? Well, and so that's an interesting calculation you'd have to do to figure out whether or not it makes sense. It's always better, particularly as you approach retirement, to reduce your debt. You want to get into retirement with no debt. That's the safest way to be. If you have to cash out your RSP, the, <clears throat> pardon me, the math you have to do is, how is that going to affect your future income stream? So I've got 20000 in my RSP and I've got 60000 of debt. Right. So 20000 in your RSP, unfortunately, folks, is effectively useless. <laughs> so... <laughs> you may as well cash it out. The funny thing is for the for the viewers on YouTube here, these these mugs they got nothing in them. So so Ted's dying here, but I'm we, dying. We, I got a frog. We can't we can't help them because they're all they're all fake. Mine's That's, real, but it's but never happened. Before. It's never happened. This is episode number five hundred and fifteen, uh, and it's never happened before. So yeah, the if if you've got a lot of debt and have to file a consumer proposal or a bankruptcy, you don't lose your RSP, right? Except for what you put into it in the last year. So it does not make sense in some cases to cash in money that you're going to lose anyways, because then you're, uh, you know, if you had filed the proposal or bankruptcy, you uh, you got to keep it. I got to push the red button there too to, to <laughs> never stop done your that money. Never done that before. This is like a first. So so I think if you have debt and have an RSP, then you want to talk to a licensed insolvency trustee and make sure you understand the <laughs> options because you don't want to make the uh, the the wrong one. Right. Which I guess brings us to the last point, which is. There are debt relief options, a consumer proposal or a bankruptcy, which obviously is becoming an increasing option for older people. Um, we don't um, um, we don't recommend it for everybody as a matter of course. But if you have more debt than you can handle, you might as well talk to an expert and figure out what the what the correct answer is rather than making the mistake of cashing in your RSP which doesn't pay off all your debt anyways. You've got a huge tax liability next year as a result. Right. And now you're kind of pooched. So the again, worst of both worlds. it's the worst of both worlds. So that's something we, uh, we suggest you avoid. So, okay. So there you go. Um, payday loans are a problem for everybody, but they are even more of a problem for seniors because they've got a fixed income expenses rising. That's a problem. Something you want to avoid. And proportionally their balances are higher. <clears throat> Yeah, it does. It's just counterintuitive. Seniors carry the highest balances for payday, and and not just in nominal <laughs> dollars, but also in ab, in like in, in relative dollars. Because right. as you say, your incomes aren't rising when you're a senior, but the the debt levels are still high. So it's a it's a problem for everyone. So again, if you are a kid of a senior, and it looks like you're parents are struggling, well, reach out, have a chat with them. And if, if they don't want to talk to you, send them to a professional. Even if they don't look like they're having problems, ask the question once a year. You know, just, how is everything? Are things okay? Are you up to date on this? It's, it's, it's an easy conversation if you start it early and you ask simple questions. If you have to wait till they're stressed out and in trouble, it's going to be much less yep. pleasant. Well, and I guess you could broach the subject by saying, well, I was talking to Joe at work and his family is going through such and such. Right. You know, apparently a lot of people are having trouble um, and maybe maybe get to talk. You know what the other thing you could do? 
you send them a link to this podcast. That, that would work. That's a subtle hint, isn't it? <laughs> but yeah, I think we'll watch for those signs, reach out. And uh, the sooner someone can deal with it, the better. And it won't get to hopefully any worse. So, right. so there you go. That is our show for today. We will put links in the show notes to everything we've talked about. And next week, next week, we're going to put water in, uh, in, in the Ted's, cup for me. Thank Ted's you. Thank cup. you very much. Um, maybe we'll, I don't know. I thought Probably uh, it, not. it added to the show. So, so there you go. So thanks for, uh, th- thanks for listening. Um, obviously those of you who are watching on YouTube, click all the likes and the subscribes and the notifications. Most of you are listening to the audio version of this. Cause I guess you don't want to see us drinking from mugs or something. Um, again, uh, Spotify, Apple podcasts, all the different mediums. We are there, uh, subscribe and we will have another show for you next week until next week. Thanks for listening. I'm Doug Hoyes. That was Debt Free in 30.